Good morning. I'd like to welcome our viewers on Hudson.org this morning for a fantastic and timely and interesting public event with the Speaker of the Lithuanian Parliament, Victoria Smilte Nielsen. Uh, you, have, you bring a lot of experience, entered politics in 2015, um, entered the uh, parliament in 2016, I believe, then rose up through the ranks and became leader of the opposition. And then uh, in 2020, I believe, led your party to um, a, a, a good turnout, a good outcome uh, the, in the uh, parliamentary elections. And as speaker of uh, the parliament, you play a very important role in shaping political debate in your country, the policy debate, and I'm guessing that is in part what brought you here to Washington. So can you tell us a little bit about your trip here, um, what you're, who you're meeting, what you're doing, and what your uh, goals are? So first of all, hello, and it's a pleasure to be here at Hudson Institute um, and, uh, well, in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, I have a number of um, uh, meetings uh, here in, uh, during my visit. Uh, tomorrow I'm uh, meeting Speaker Pelosi and uh, senators. Uh, I'm also, uh, I have some events scheduled at the United Nations in New York uh, in, uh, during this week. So, um, well, uh, it's a time when the bilateral relations uh, between Lithuania and the United States are especially important. Of course, first of all, um, in the face of the war in Ukraine, that has been a dominant theme in Lithuania, in Lithuanian uh, political life, but also for, well, more broadly uh, with uh, the people of Lithuania since uh, February 24th. It feels very close to us in many ways, and um, uh, well, and uh, that has been also uh, an additional reason to um, very closely cooperate with our most important allies. So that is the reason I'm here as well. Yeah. Well, Madam Speaker, I'm glad you brought up the bilateral relationship. Uh, Lithuania is a great example of why uh, NATO enlargement works, how it benefits U.S. interests. Lithuania has shown uh, a number of times over recent years that it wants to be a, a security exporter, not a security importer. And it's stepped up to the plate, whether it has been in Afghanistan, through regional security with the host nation support for the enhanced forward presence in Lithuania, and, and also with Ukraine, uh, really stepping up to the plate and uh, on a per capita basis, being one of the, the largest uh, donors to uh, Ukraine since the second invasion happened in, in February of this year. So I, I want to ask you specifically about Russia, uh, Russia's role in the region, Russia's, uh, th any possible Russian threats, and not only specifically to Lithuania, although that would be interesting, but also to the, the Baltic Sea region as a whole. How is this perceived in your country by both policymakers, but just the average person on the street? Well, let me start with saying that um, the, this year has been the time for us to once again uh, evaluate how important were the decisions taken uh, 18 years ago and how important it was that Lithuania has become the EU member and the NATO member especially. And should this not have happened back then, today the Baltic countries, Lithuania, would be another gray zone that would be, well, so to speak, up for grabs. So, of course, we appreciate a lot being part of uh, the defensive alliance. And uh, we also, um, uh, well, care a lot about doing our own homework properly and being, uh, well, um, uh, you know, dependable ally. So um, once, uh, well, since the second invasion, uh, since February 24th, the parliament has uh, reacted, um, uh, well, very quickly and strongly. We have passed uh, the decision to allocate more funds for defense. Uh, so right now we are at 2.52% of GDP, and this number is set to rise. And there is, uh, well, I'm also glad to say that in our parliament there is a consensus on this, on defense policy. There's been consensus on foreign policy for a long time. That, and that of course, is part of why we have had um, well, uh, these achievements and successes in terms of fortifying our, our uh, role um, in, in, in the NATO and in, uh, in the EU. Um, 
As to Russia's role, well, Lithuania is one of those countries that have had least illusions about what to expect of Putin Russia, and we have been very vocal about it. Um, since, uh, well, since 2008 in Georgia, and of course again in 2014 with Crimea. And uh, today, uh, well, we are in the situation where, you know, it is not um, pleasant to say that we told you so. That is not, well, it does not make you happy, but of course it's important that we do not repeat the mistakes that have been uh, done before mm. uh, in the West and in, 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 in the European Union when. Um, uh, some months uh, or some time after uh, aggressive, unjustified, um, well, aggressions or actions from Russia. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, well, the, the dealing with Russia has come back to business as usual. That cannot happen again. And uh, in Lithuania, we have uh, amazing popular support uh, for Ukrainians. We have uh, more than 60,000 of war refugees, more than 65,000 of war refugees at the moment. In Lithuania, mostly, of course, it is women and children. They are well integrated. Uh, many of them, um, the vast majority of them, have been welcomed in the house of uh, ordinary people yeah. as a reaction to what was happening. And, uh, well, I do not exaggerate when I say that, you know, February 24th has really been a, a turning point in Lithuania. It has captured our attention, uh, the country came together in this you know, popular uh, sentiment of that we have to help Ukraine with whatever we can. And uh, uh, well, it has been the case ever since. And um, well, I hope that uh, our voice was also helpful in amassing that support in the EU. And if we should uh, look at uh, uh, the horrible things that have happened and unfortunately continue to happen in Ukraine from some sort of silver lining side. Of course, uh, Sweden and Finland joining NATO are uh, crucial, and it is the opposite of uh, what Putin was expecting when he launched yeah. the, uh, you know, the uh, the war. And uh, well, that is the way to go. We have to make sure that um, uh, we we show resolve, we show unity, and uh, that um, we. Uh, as uh, European Union completely disentangle on whatever dependency was left on Russia uh, as we uh, continue to help Ukraine to achieve victory. And um, I, it's great to hear about the social cohesion and the unified response in supporting Ukraine, both on the street, but also in parliament and in politics. And that reminded me, I, I omitted a very important point that you are the member of the Liberal Party, the leader of the Liberal Party. I didn't mention your party affiliation. I went through your distinguished uh, political career without mentioning perhaps the, the most important piece of information. Um, so you, you talk about the importance of Finland and Sweden joining the alliance and, and uh, how Putin wasn't expecting that. I suspect there's a lot of things that have happened over the past six months that he, he wasn't expecting. And uh, you, you talk about um, the, the mood in Lithuania on responding to, to Russian aggression. Now, there's one specific uh, issue that caught the attention of many U.S. commentators and policymakers over the summer, and that was specifically with uh, Kaliningrad and this issue of transit, uh, Russian trains transiting uh, Lithuanian territory to Kaliningrad. Now, of course, Lithuania is strategically located in the Baltic Sea region because of this proximity uh, to Kaliningrad. Uh, what can you tell us about this if you want to, to clar clarify any misconceptions that might have been out there? You know, how does this, this debate play out in Lithuania regarding Kaliningrad? Well, the uh a sensitive position, uh, the sensitive geopolitical uh, position the, um, of Lithuania is uh, obvious. We uh, have Kaliningrad enclave and uh, also a uh, long border, 680 kilometer border with Belarus, which is under Lukashenko's regime. So it is true that we are, uh, well, that we have these sensitivities. When it comes to uh, Kaliningrad, well, we are part of, uh, we are uh, part of the EU and uh, we follow the procedures and the decisions that are taken 
uh, together with our uh, allies and partners. So that is uh, basically what can be said about the Kaliningrad issue. And while Russia was trying to make it uh, sound as if it is something between uh, Moscow and Vilnius, that is obviously not the case. It is, uh, well, these are the decisions that are taken in uh, our union uh, and, um, well, whatever um, sort of uh, discussions could have been taking place is, uh, well, it is, uh, so to speak, a problem between uh, Brussels and Moscow. So uh, I, I believe that, well, it has been resolved and Lithuania has been very vocal about uh, that um, uh, the sanctions towards Russia should be deepened, they should be um, continued with, and there is no doubt that they are uh, painful and rising the toll of the war on Russia uh, gives effect. And actually today as we speak, uh, the new um, well decision comes into effect that uh, we have taken with our uh, closest neighbors, with Latvia, Estonia, and Poland, that uh, deals with the um, Schengen visas for Russian tourists. Mm -hmm. So they will not be allowed to enter into uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, as uh, while the war in Ukraine is ongoing. Um, we do not believe that um, uh, you know, the right of uh, Russian uh, tourists um, enjoy the privileges of uh, spending time in Europe is uh, something that is uh, Undeniable. Yeah, I think here in Washington, any reasonable per well, it, it, here in America, any reasonable person would agree <coughs> with that sentiment, uh, especially when uh, more and more atrocities are being uncovered um, as areas of Ukraine are being liberated. Now, of course, Lithuania has been at the forefront of supporting uh, Ukraine and raising awareness of what's happening in Ukraine from the very beginning, and by the beginning, I mean 2014. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was Lithuania that re invoked uh, Article 4 of the North Atlantic Treaty, which basically calls for consultations at the highest level. Um, and this was done, I think, with, with Lithuania and Poland in, in 2014 to bring the issue of Russia's annexation of Crimea um, to, the, to the forefront uh, on, onto NATO's agenda. And because of that, you know, the, the issue became a matter for NATO, and we saw some of the steps taken in Eastern Europe to uh, boost NATO's defenses uh, from, the, from the Baltic Sea down to the, uh, to the Black Sea. Uh, so what, what more can NATO do to help Ukraine? What more can individual countries do to help Ukraine right now? I mean, we are you know, well over 200 days into this war that was supposed to last three days. Um, we are learning a lot of lessons. We're making a lot of progress with our assistance to Ukraine. But from your point of view in Vilnius, what are we not doing enough of? As to 2014, it is true that Lithuania has been uh, very vocal uh, about what was happening in Crimea back then. I don't believe that we, um, you know, that that we uh, in, enforced the Article 4, but uh, there was discussion about that right. definitely. And uh, well, fast forwarding to now, uh, first of all, uh, what um, has been done already. Well, it is important to appreciate what we have done up to today. Yeah. I have mentioned uh, Sweden and Finland um, joining NATO. It's a, it's a huge decision. It uh, changes the situation, the security situation, in the Baltic Sea region clearly. Um, uh, it makes it more, more stable, more secure. Uh, another thing that has been done and that, uh, you know, uh, if we were meeting here a year ago, we would probably just have a very theoretical discussion about the possibility of uh, Ukraine and Moldova uh, being granted the EU candidate status. Yes. That has been accomplished already. So um, these things, of course, are crucial. But what can we do more? Well, we have to continue on the, um, on the um, road that has been taken. So uh, help for Ukraine, weapons for Ukraine. We can see that they are, uh, well, how, how uh, you know, how good, how determined they are in defending yeah. their own country. Yeah. So they need yeah. a little bit of help. So this uh, should not um, in any way diminish. We have to continue with that. Sanctions against Russia. 
And also, what I think is a very important message is strengthening the NATO eastern flank. As today we have two fronts uh, in general. We have a hot front, uh, a war happening in Ukraine, and we have this kind of cold front that runs along the NATO eastern border that uh, has potential to flare up. So we have to, while we have time, while, uh, well, a very sort of, um, um, uh, Openly speaking, you can say that Ukraine is buying time, paying the most uh, expensive price there is. Um, uh, we have to strengthen the NATO eastern flank with boots on the ground, with uh, more presence of troops, so that there would be no uh, room for a misjudgment uh, for uh, Putin. Now, we, we talked about the cohesion across Lithuanian society. And we talked about NATO being united and supporting Ukraine and arming Ukraine and possibly even um, taking steps to train Ukrainians, for example. Uh, but I want to talk about the European Union and uh, some of the issues surrounding cohesion or lack thereof on certain uh, policy responses. You mentioned the uh, limitations on um, Schengen with Russian tourists. I know that not every European Union member is, um, well, at least privately, they're not completely on board with this. Uh, on other issues regarding sanctions and, the, and importing Russian sources of energy, again, this is another area that, that fractures um, cohesion inside the European Union. And for an organization that, at least on the big foreign policy issues, likes to find unanimity, um, the lowest common denominator approach often leads to uh, a, a weak policy. So what can, what can you tell us about um, your thinking on how united the European Union is in tackling some of these non-military challenges that Russia is posing, not only to Ukraine, but to, to the continent as a whole? Well, um... I would like to say that it is uh, more united than one would have expected, perhaps, yes. uh, more yeah. than half a year ago. And uh, quite some of decisions and responses have been also quicker than one would have expected and more determined. That is not to say that there is no room for improvement. And Lithuania, uh, for instance, Lithuanian parliament has been very vocal on that. Uh, since February 24th, we have adopted eight resolutions in support for Ukraine and calling for sanctions against Russia in designated Russia, uh, designating Russia uh, the state that uh, supports terrorism and um, calling for uh, international criminal uh, courts. So many uh, things that uh, are uh, in the pipeline that are being discussed, uh, well, we have been uh, also a part of. So I believe that in this situation, it is, um, uh, well, it is not the size of a country that determines, uh, you know, the, 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 well, the importance of your voice. And, uh, well, it so happens that uh, the Baltic countries, Poland, uh, well, obviously Lithuania, has some expertise and no illusions as to what to expect. And um, we have been trying to be um, uh, very active in um, our uh, talks with colleagues from other EU parliaments. And I think uh, it brought results. As to what, um, uh, what to expect forwardly and of this autumn and winter, uh, well, it is clear that we are right now in uh, some sort of, um, you know, uh, strategic uh, patience um, game, if you wish, uh, where um, uh, it is being decided who will back down first. And, well, it is clear that the sanctions are painful. It is clear that helping Ukraine works and helps them to repel the aggression. Uh, it is also clear that Russia is hoping for that the resolve of uh, European Union countries as they enter political cycles, as they enter perhaps turbulences uh, that are based on the very high energy prices, uh, high inflation, that it will eventually result in this resolve or determination to help Ukraine uh, weakening. And that, of course, we cannot 
uh, allowed to happen. And uh, um, well, I think this, um, you know, this shock, this crisis situation, and I'm talking right now about high energy prices, that is also a, a, a big, big topic right now for Lithuania in our uh, autumn uh, political season. It is also an opportunity for the European Union to um, finish uh, completely with the uh, being with the dependence on Russia, and uh, uh, to achieve uh, well uh, an energy revolution, to aggressively invest in renewables, to uh, basically fill in the gaps which still exist, and uh, uh, make sure that there is no going uh, back to being dependent on Russia. There is no going back to the strategy that has proven to be wrong as engaging Russia economically did not prevent it from um, launching this aggression. On the contrary, it, uh, uh, well, you could say it acted as uh, you know, a signal of some sort of weakness or inability of the West uh, to, uh, to, um, uh, you know, to be determined and strong. And that we cannot, of course, allow to happen again. So, well, I believe that this is the, the, the way forward and I have, uh, well, uh, I would say that there are a lot of encouraging signals uh, from uh, the European Union countries. Yeah. And, uh, well, the fact that Russia already uh, has openly declared that, you know, it's sanctions on or energy in a way helps it as well, because, well, there, there are no, there is no more um, ambiguity about yes. that. Yeah. And, uh, well, I believe that EU, uh, well, cannot be allowed to be blackmailed like this. So we have to continue disengaging. And Lithuania actually has been um, uh, one of the most, um, one of the uh, countries that took uh, decisions on this earliest. So uh, back in 2014, we have, um, uh, we have launched our uh, LNG terminal mm -hmm. that we called the Independence. Yes. And it has been uh, uh, very important up until now, but of course now it is even more crucial as uh, we uh, have been able to, um, well, become um, uh, the first country in the European Union to stop buying energy from, uh, from Russia. Yeah, Lithuania has been known to be this regional leader on the energy issue and with the LNG terminal and also the, um, the NATO certified center of excellence for energy security. Um, you know, really stands out as a, another example of Lithuania trying to find solutions to these uh, problems, not just complaining about problems or identifying problems, but being part of the uh, solution. Uh, as Speaker of the Lithuanian Parliament, what sort of um, co coordination or consultation do you have with other speakers around Europe? Um, is, it, is there any formal mechanism? Is it informal? Um, is it effective? <laughs> Uh, I would, I would, I'm interested by this specific aspect of, of your role in uh, the Lithuanian parliament. I would say it's both formal and informal. And uh, of course, after, after uh, the beginning of uh, a full-scale war, uh, it became uh, one of the main, well, a very important aspect of my work. As um, uh, in the first weeks, uh, I have taken the task to uh, have a conversation with basically every uh, colleague from EU and many from the NATO parliament, uh, well, the speakers of parliaments, uh, to, um, well, give a message about Lithuania's view uh, on, uh, on the war and the necessity of the, me well, of the measure measures that have to be taken. And we have also quite some formats that um, I think are uh, both effective and meaningful, like for instance, the Nordic Baltic aid format. It is, uh, well, the, the, it, it uh, brings together the Nordic countries and the Baltic countries uh, speakers. And we have recently in August had a meeting where we discussed energy security, more integration with our Nordic colleagues. And that has meaning for us because well, it, um, in a way, you know, history uh, tends to repeat in the 90s when we were 
uh, you know, just on, on, on the beginning of our road, in the beginning of our independence, the cooperation and the help of uh, Nordic countries was uh, essential for us. Yeah. And now it is also um, just as important that we become even more integrated in the fields that uh, are still left uh, the, uh, and that we, um, well, well, I envision, uh, you know, and I would like to uh, one day to say that, well, it is uh, basically the Nordic Eight, uh, because this, uh, this concept of the Baltic countries is unfortunately quite often abused by Putin, uh, as if to say, you know, that they still belong to that uh, old empire. Yeah. So I yeah. think it is very important that, you know, our integration, our, uh, our um, uh, position um, is... Uh, in, 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 in this um, uh, side that leaves absolutely no, no question or doubts for anyone. Well, it certainly does not leave any <laughs> questions for us. So uh, these, uh, these um, uh, I would say these um, formats are plenty and uh, well, I try to have a lot of meetings with colleagues, both online and live, to, uh, to discuss our common actions and I believe they result uh, in uh, quite some uh, cohesion uh, also between our countries. And next, next year, uh, Lithuania will be hosting a NATO summit. Um, in my opinion, uh, I think that the timing and the location is fantastic. The last time a uh, NATO summit was held in Central or Eastern Europe, it was 2016 at Poland. So um, it's, it's long overdue. It's great, great that it's back in the region. Um, of course, uh, matters like this are probably matters of a NATO summit are probably the, mainly the prerogative of the executive. But because there's this uh, political cohesion on the issues of NATO and transatlantic security in Ukraine, there's no doubt that the legislative branch in Lithuania will be informing this debate about the agenda, uh, about what the focus of the summit needs to be. Um, so, in, in your opinion, as speaker, you know what should the agenda be for this next NATO summit? What should be the big items that are looked at and addressed um, as we look towards Vilnius 2023? Well, it's true that uh, Vilnius 2023 is already well. It's an event that uh, all the branches are preparing for. It's a big event for Vilnius and comes at exactly the right time, as as, as you rightly pro pointed out. Well, we see the decisions taken in Madrid as important steps in the right direction. For it, us, it is very important to ensure that uh, the NATO eastern flank, as I was saying, is um, uh, enforced, is, is, is properly protected, and we will continue um, uh, talking to our allies uh, to make sure that there is a brigade size uh, of uh, troops in located uh, in in Lithuania, and that we continue expanding on the um, defense um, uh, systems in in the Baltic countries, uh, well, based on I think very uh, rational and um, and um, realistic evaluation of the security situation in the region. Uh, so I, I believe that uh, this Vilnius uh, summit will be a good uh, follow-up, uh, well, a good next step uh, after Madrid, and that the same direction will be uh, will be kept. Yep, and hopefully um, by the time of the summit, NATO will have two new members: exactly. uh, Finland and Sweden. Um, how, how do you think this changes the dynamics of the alliance? Or how does this change um, the situation on the ground in the greater Baltic Sea region? You know, in the past, um, while NATO always had a good relationship, a good working relationship with both Finland and Sweden, it was never guaranteed that if the chips were down, that Finland and Sweden would, would be there for NATO. And now they're going to be in the alliance and there'll be no question about this. But meanwhile, I, I believe, I don't know for certain, but I suspect that the Kremlin always assumed that in the event of some sort of conflict in the Baltic Sea region that Finland and Sweden would align with NATO. I think they just built that into their planning assumptions. So practically, how do you think their membership um, impacts the situation in the region? 
Well, I think it's a game changer for the region. And uh, well, I, I would start with the fact that Finland and Sweden was, um, you know, it was uh, famous for its neutrality. And we cannot, you know, we cannot overestimate what kind of shift yeah. in the understanding Absolutely. of the public in those countries happened very quickly after February 24th. I've had a chance also to meet my colleagues from the parliament, both from Swe Swedish and uh, Finnish, and uh, talk to them. And well, there's been really a huge shift that um, uh, changed uh, the course that has been for long decades, basically for a century in, uh, you know, in, in looking at, let's say, military support for other countries. So this famous neutrality, well, quickly gave way to, uh, to the changed security situation. So for a start, and I think it's an important point that um, Putin's calculation was wrong. And, uh, and uh, the countries were not, uh, well, the countries uh, took what was, uh, took decisions that were necessary to take in the changing security environment. For us, for the Baltic Sea region, well, of course it is huge because the Baltic Sea becomes, well, some sort of, well, you know, internal NATO Sea, yeah. you, you, you yeah. could say. And that, of course, has uh, big implications militarily. I will not go into details here, but, uh, but clearly uh, it has uh, important implications. And as I said, Lithuanian um, uh, geographical situation is sensitive. But for us to have Finland and Sweden joining NATO gives uh, a lot of, uh, well, strategic depth uh, and, uh, and additional uh, security. So we, of course, look forward to welcoming them to the NATO family in Vilnius. And they are a, they will be a NATO enlargement success story, in my opinion, just like your country is also a NATO enlargement success story. Uh, the issue of NATO enlargement here in Washington, uh, for the most part, is not controversial, but there are some who are um, questioning uh, why you know, U.S. taxpayers should be adding new members into the alliance and, and um, placing further burdens on the United States in terms of security in, in Europe. And um, luckily, uh, this, didn't, this sentiment didn't materialize into many votes in the U.S. Senate when they recently voted on the accessions protocol for Finland and Sweden. In fact, it resulted in one person uh, yes. vo voting no. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, under, under, the, under the surface, the sentiment is there. Um, what, you know, what would you say to, um, you come here to the United States as a country in, in Eastern Europe, um, that borders Russia, that was occupied by the Soviet Union for decades, um, and now you're perhaps you're one of the best members in, in the alliance. So, you know, what would you say to those people here in Washington who question the value or the importance of NATO enlargement? Well, I would say that it would be inexact, and even uh, probably I can say that it would be a mistake to see the war in Ukraine as a regional conflict that has no impact on the United States. I think it's a clear attack on the international order that, uh, you know, that we have had since uh, basically the end of the World War II and that uh, the United States has been instrumental in building and also on the European uh, security architecture. So it is an assault on that. It, well, the aim of uh, Putin, the aim of Russia clearly is to change the rules of, of the game, to plunge us into chaos, and that cannot be allowed to happen. So I believe that it is also in essential interest of the United States to keep this um, these achievements uh, that have been uh, so much invested in uh, for a long decades uh, intact and strengthen them. And of course, in the um, present context of uh, autocrac autocratic powers becoming more assertive, more aggressive, well, uh, the more active measures are also um, called for from our side, from the democratic side. So um, I, uh, well, I think it is uh, important and I would say inspiring to see the leadership of the United States in the face of Russian aggression. And of course, I think that keeping that, uh, keeping support for Ukraine serves the interest of the whole of democratic world 
as Ukrainians are defending the, um, you know, the international uh, order based on rules as we have known it and as we would like to see it in the future, I believe. That's a good message. I hope uh, policymakers here in Washington are watching live or watching later on Hudson.org so uh, they can hear the truth from, from the ground where it has been beneficial for the Alliance and for U.S. interests. Um, and pretty soon the Alliance will be selecting a new Secretary General. Um, is the current Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, former Prime Minister of Norway, I feel like has done a fantastic job at a very difficult time. I mean, during his tenure, we've, I feel like we've seen it all from yes. pandemic to invasion to you know, an emboldened China and, and everything else. Uh, and difficult governments and administrations perhaps uh, across the alliance. And he's been able to manage all of this. As we look towards the next Secretary General, of course, I'm not asking you to give us a name who you'd like to support. And honestly, I'm not even sure if your government has endorsed anyone. But what are some of the attributes, what are some of the characteristics you think would make a good NATO Secretary General? Oh, that's a tricky question. Uh, well, I think I will limit myself to saying that I'm looking forward to, you know, to welcoming the new Secretary General in Vilnius. And uh, that would be, of course, um, well, one more reason to have the global focus on our summit in Vilnius. Um, but of course, it's, uh, it's a very important uh, position. It's a crucial position, essential position, and it will continue to be so in the upcoming years. So. Well, uh, we have a, an important decision in our Well, hands. I understand <laughs> you're, a, you're a politician, and in your capacity here in Washington, you're, you're a stateswoman, a, a diplomat, so to speak, as well. I'll, for what it's worth, I'll say, I think it's time for a, a Central or Eastern European country uh, to have someone from, from this region nominated as Secretary General. I think it's long overdue, right. especially when the, the big focus of the alliance is in the East. Uh, to me, it just makes sense that you have someone that can lead the alliance um, that has experience from what is the most important region for the alliance. So that's just, those are my views uh, for, for what they're worth. Um, another big question mark for NATO is China. That, well, a big question mark for, for NATO or the European Union or on the national level is, uh, is, is China. Um, China, no doubt, poses a lot of challenges to, to Europe and also to the North America, European, transatlantic community. But many of the challenges they, um, they pose, whether it's uh, you know, questionable or dodgy investments in infrastructure projects or you know, pushing uh, Huawei's 5G networks, uh, these are issues that you know, NATO doesn't have the policy competencies to necessarily deal with. The, the EU does and the member states do as well, but not necessarily NATO. But yet there's this uh, drive inside the alliance to focus more on China and the Indo-Pacific. Um, in the last strategic concept, China got a mention, whereas in 20, uh, 2010 at the strategic concept in Lisbon, the word China isn't mentioned at all. Uh, in that strategic concept. In your opinion, uh, you know, what should we be doing, we being NATO, be doing about China? And what should we, we being as a society or as individual nations in Europe and North America, be doing about China? Well, the changing landscape has been, as you said, uh, mirrored in the uh, new strategic concept where China was mentioned. And uh, when it comes to, uh, well, I can speak on behalf of Lithuania here, uh, well, uh, Lithuania has had um, certain <coughs> challenges uh, in the fact that um, over the past years we have um, taken certain decisions like uh, leaving the then 17 plus 1 format as an ineffective. Well, today it's the 14 plus yep. 1 format because the other Baltic countries has fo have followed our suit, yep. later expanding our uh, cooperation um, with uh, Taiwan um, in uh, the economic culture and other fields. So we have been uh, subject to uh, pressure from uh, Ch Chinese side. And uh, well, uh, we note that there is uh, well, a certain 
a rising level of assertiveness and aggressiveness. Um, uh, well, nevertheless, well, uh, I would say that, um, well, each sovereign country chooses its partners, and I think uh, this time is especially important for democracies of the world to support each other and to cooperate. And this is the light that uh, we see it in. Yeah, again, I, I did forget about that, the point about Lithuania being the first to leave the 17 plus one and really setting the uh, stage. So once again, leading um, uh, on a very important uh, geopolitical issue. Now we're, we're running uh, close to um, the end of uh, this event, but I have one final question for you. I think a lot of our viewers uh, will be interested to learn that not only are you a distinguished uh, uh, politician and stateswoman, but you also had a very successful career playing chess. Uh, I believe the International Chess Federation uh, announced or granted or appointed you as a, a, a grandmaster in chess. You're a one-time European women's champion, a two-times Lithuanian national champion at chess. So how, how, if at all, has this background and experience playing chess helped shape your worldview, your regional view, when it comes to these big geopolitical issues um, like dealing with Russia, like Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Well, my 25-year experience playing chess and being professional for most of my uh, adult life, of course, well, shapes the way I think about processes and uh, the way I, I am as a politician. And of course, chess experience, it helps. Um, it helps in, um, you know, in drawing, uh, well, you know, possible, um, in, in expecting possible outcomes of, uh, of decisions and uh, in thinking strategically about uh, certain events and processes. At the same time, I would like to say that, you know, chess is a very, um, I would say it's a very straightforward and honorable game. And that's why I love it so much, yeah. uh, because you have two opponents sitting at a chessboard with a clearly defined rules, and there is no um, space for bluffing, uh, and there, is, there are just two <laughs> minds competing intellectually. Well, when it comes to politics, um, uh, you know, the rules are much more murky and, uh, uh, and uh, Therefore, um, it is, uh, it's more like playing a simul on 50 boards, uh, blindfolded sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, of course, uh, I am inspired by uh, such uh, leaders and, and uh, former chess players like Gary Kasparov, who has also been course, very yeah. insightful, yeah, uh, especially insightful when it comes to Putin's Russia. So I think uh, there must be something about chess that Helps us. Well, maybe the next NATO Secretary General should be a, a chess player. <laughs> I, uh, I would support <laughs> that. <laughs> well, Madam Speaker, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come here to the Hudson Institute to speak with us today. And um, good luck with your visit here and have a safe journey back to your home. And I want to thank our viewers on Hudson.org for tuning in today. Uh, this, uh, this webinar event will be um, found later on in the future if you want to share it on social media at Hudson.org. And please check out the website to look at future events that we will be hosting both uh, in person and online. Thank you. Thank you.